So welcome back, everybody. Also, welcome to our rector who has joined us today. Um, uh, we are now on the final stretch, the grand finale of this conference, which I hope you enjoyed as much as I have enjoyed it. Um, I have now the pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for this keynote. I'll do this very briefly because um, we want to have m as much time as we can for the keynote. That will be 40 minutes, then there's 30 minutes of Q&A, and then Kunal will take over and our rector will come in as well. So, the keynote today is on the challenge of offshore tax havens, a topic that has come up in quite a few sessions already of this conference. And it is delivered by Niels Johannesson, who is here to my right. So we are very pleased to have Niels today with us. Um, Niels is a professor at University of Copenhagen and um, born, raised and bred, I think, in Copenhagen. <laughs> and he tells me so that he's moving on to Oxford Zoom now. He's also the co-director of the EU Tax Observatory. Niels's work covers a quite range uh, of research topics, um, and I think the ones that are probably most interesting for us here today is, of course, in the areas of public um, finance, tax havens, and also tax evasion. He has published in the best journals that you can think of, American Economic Review, Journal of Public Economics, and so on and so forth. Um, he has also given quite a few policy talks, which with an audience with a lot of people working with policymakers or being policymakers, I think that that's also very nice to know. Uh, and he has received numerous awards, um, for example, also one for excellence in teaching. So I look now forward to a very instructive and uh, full of learnings uh, filled keynote. And with that, I'll leave the floor to you. Thank you very much for that introduction, and thanks for having me, and uh, thanks for coming here. I'm looking forward to it, not least to, to chat with you guys uh, after, after my talk. So, so the talk is called uh, The Challenge of Offshore Tax Havens. And let me just, because time is short, uh, jump right in and you know, try to say in a few words, so uh, what does this offshore challenge consist in from the perspective of a public finance economist? And I'll do that by you know, saying in a, in a very stylized way, so what do offshore tax havens do? And I've listed three things here. So, so the first thing that they do is that they, you could say, help most national firms obtain low taxes on their profits. And how do they do that? Well, they do it by offering basically very low effect, effective corporate tax rates, meaning that most national firms were able to you know, book their profits in these places, shift their profits away from where they actually like, belong to and into these offshore havens, get like, a low uh, tax rate on their, on their global profits. So the second thing that you, could, that you could point to is that they help wealthy individuals evade taxes on personal income. And here the key word is secrecy. So the idea is that, that these wealthy individuals are actually kind of taxable on their full income where they live. But because uh, of these like, different secrecy technologies and tax havens, they're able to, to kind of hide the income that they, uh, that they earn uh, in these places. Uh, so they are very hard to tax for the domestic tax authorities. And finally, uh, tax havens also you know, help criminals, corrupt elites, you know, hide and, and launder their illicit funds. And you can call that like money laundering. And again, the key note here, is, or the key word here is also uh, secrecy, obviously. So, um, so economists have been, been like working with these topics a lot for the last uh, 10 years. And if you wanted to kind of summarize like what, what have been the, the major questions they've tried to address uh, in this field, you can do it the following way. So first, uh, economists have tried to measure the scale of this undesirable, undesirable activity that happens uh, through tax havens and also measure it, its consequences. So like how many profits are booked in havens? What are the revenue losses for the, for the countries where the profits actually belong, for example? Uh, this is no easy task. Why? Well, just like the ob like one obvious reason is that a lot of the stuff that happens in tax havens is, you know, secret in nature, meaning that there are no kind of official statistics to resort to. So often you need to be very creative and like kind of taking out data sources that, that speak to these, uh, this measurement. 
And the second thing that the economists have been doing a lot is to try to, because there's been like prolific policy activity in this area, so we've been trying to you know, say something about how good these policies are, how effective are they at, at stopping this uh, undesirable activity uh, through tax havens. All right, and the two things are kind of connected because I think the economists, by, by pointing to like, the, the, the large scale of these, uh, these activities, they've actually been instrumental also in, in you know, um, pushing the policy agenda forward and, and making policymakers understand the need to actually do something about these problems. So uh, I'm not a development economist by training, but kind of being asked to, to come here was a great chance for me to, to think you know, more carefully about like, how development, uh, like developing countries fit into this, this picture. And so I decided to do two things in this lecture. So the first is to like, try to, to bring some evidence to the table uh, saying something about whether there is or whether there is not like a development gradient in exposure to offshore tax havens. So should like, governments in, in developing countries be more or less concerned about this problem than their counterparts in developed countries? Um, and the second question I, I decided to think about is like whether like, because much of the, the policy measures that are being taken right now are being developed like, in, a, in a global setting where basically it's one policy that is, you know, like that is rolled out uh, globally, and I want to think about, you know, whether these these policies, whether they are actually there are these designs, whether they are, they are a good fit for developing countries, or whether like you can do something to, you know, maybe make this work better in a developing country uh, context. And so with the first bullet, I, I will try to really like do something, I mean, simple but at least quantitative to try to bring different data sources uh, to the table. And, and the last point is going to be more like a, a qualitative uh, discussion. And just because I don't have two hours, but only uh, 40 minutes, then I decided to just like, look into like, one of these bullets and not try to, to cover like, uh, all three of them. So we're going to focus here like, on, on offshore tax evasion, the idea that, you know, that wealthy individuals can you know, hide their assets in tax havens and escape, like, evade taxes in their home country. All right. So before we, we dig into these two questions, let me just take one step back and you know, try to tell you like, what I think are the three like, most important and also robust findings about offshore uh, tax evasion that economists have, uh, have come up with in the, in the past uh, like five, ten years. So the first one is that, I mean, that, there is a, that actually there's quite a lot of uh, households own quite a lot of wealth in, in, uh, in tax havens. So there's a lot of, of money out there that we need to think about, you know, like uh, what is it doing and is it tax compliant and so on. Second insight is that these offshore assets are extremely concentrated at the very top of the wealth distribution. So obviously wealthy people are wealthier than others. Uh, that's that's you know, self-evident, but, but offshore assets are much more concentrated than other types of assets uh, at the top of the wealth distribution. And finally, it's also uh, a well-documented fact, or at least, I mean, there's a caveat here because this might be changing uh, these years, but, but that it, it used to be the case, at least, that a large share of these offshore assets were not tax compliant. All right, so it kind of could be because like, the motive for putting them in the first place in the tax haven was like tax evasion. So let me just say a little bit about like, how uh, people have, have made these points. Um, so the first paper to kind of really convincingly measure offshore assets, uh, assets in, in, in tax havens, was uh, Gabriel Sukman like 10 years ago, where he, he shows, you know, that if you combine different macro statistics, you can make a convincing case that households globally own around $6,000 billion, or so $6 trillion, in uh, financial assets in tax havens. And like, so how do, you, how do you measure that? That's really something that is, you know, like, in its nature uh, secret, but the, the idea here is that, you know, when households are hiding assets in havens, there'll be, uh, I mean, the, the, in these international financial statistics that try to measure these uh, cross-border flows or stocks of assets, they'll be able to capture the liability side of these investments, but not the asset side, meaning that basically the difference at the global level between, you know, cross-border liabilities and cross-border assets they should be the same, there is a difference, and that reflects exactly kind of uh, hidden, hidden assets. And just like a simple example illustrates the idea, so if I, as a Danish taxpayer, have a Swiss account, a secret Swiss account, and I use it to hold the Microsoft, Microsoft stock, for example, well then the US 
the statisticians, statisticians in the US will know that there is like a Microsoft stock that is owned by someone foreign, so they'll record like a foreign liability. But there is no country that records a, a foreign asset because Denmark don't know what I'm doing because it's, it's like my hidden account. And the Swiss bank knows that this is not, there's not like a Swiss person uh, owning this asset. So when people uh, hide assets in tax havens, there'll be like a gap between liabilities and assets in these, in these official financial statistics. And, uh, and basically like the, the, the gap reflects exactly like the size of this, uh, this hidden wealth. So at this point, you might be a bit uh, concerned about this kind of residual measurement. I think maybe this paper, this uh, graph taken from the paper will convince you a little bit more. So this basically shows you by country the size of this liability asset gap. Uh, and, people, and countries are ranked here by like, the size of the gap. So like at the top here, you have Luxembourg. And so Luxembourg uh, is a place where there's a lot of, like it's a tax haven. There was bank secrecy and there's a, they have a huge fund industry. And basically uh, here, like Luxembourg says, well, there are two, $2 trillion dollars coming into Luxembourg in foreign portfolio investment. But if you sum, up, up, uh, sum across all the, like the, the, the other countries in the world, they are only recording assets of $1,000 billion uh, dollars into Luxembourg. And so the difference, these $1,000 uh, billion is, is um, arguably reflects like uh, hidden assets. Okay? And you can see, so after Luxembourg, you have Cayman Islands, and then you have Ireland, and they're all kind of like tax havens that, uh, that, you know, like that, that play a big role in the funds industry. So this, this is really kind of uh, something that convinced me that you know, this, is probably, this is probably right. All right, the second insight is uh, about like, the concentration of these offshore assets at, at the top of the wealth distribution. And here, I think the first paper to say something uh, convincing about that is, is work by myself and Gabriel Sukman and Annette Alstedt-Seder. Uh, where basically, so this is the paper about Scandinavia. So we have like really detailed wealth data about like around 10 million households in Scandinavia. And the name of the game here was to find kind of micro data saying something about people's like hidden offshore wealth, M combine it with these like wealth records and then see like, so who actually in Scandinavia owns the offshore wealth. And we have two samples of, uh, of like two micro samples. So one is leaked data from a big Swiss uh, private bank. And the other one is uh, an amnesty where people come forward and say, well, I had these offshore assets. In both of these sources, it turns out that around half of the offshore assets belongs to the top 0.01%, all right? So that's really like in Scandinavia with 10 million households, the top the wealthiest 1,000 households own around half of the, of the offshore assets. So like a massive concentration. You might think that this is just Scandinavia. Actually, like a number of papers out there now that do like Similar things in different countries, also developing countries. So I listed a few here from Argentina, Colombia, and some work I'm, I'm doing now in South Africa. And I mean, so the, the magnitudes vary a little bit across countries, but the basic picture is, is the same. Uh, this is a picture from our paper that shows you the red and the black lines shows you, show you, uh, so basically by wealth group on the x-axis, show you like the share of the offshore assets that are held like in these different wealth groups. And you can see in both samples around half of the offshore assets belong at the, the very top, like to the right, the 0.01% of the richest well, uh, households. And that like it contrasts massively with the dotted line, which is like the, the distribution of, of recorded wealth in, uh, in, in tax returns. Okay, so offshore assets are very concentrated at the top relative to, to other kinds of assets. Then finally, uh, a large share of these offshore assets are tax non-compliant. Uh, so th that fact shows up in a number of settings. So for example, in these leaks, in the cases where you can kind of, uh, you can study the question in leak samples, you will see that the compliance rate is typically very low. So in our case, we actually, like for these guys with an account in a Swiss bank, we can actually check, well, had these people, had they actually self-reported their account? And it turned out to be the case for five, 10% of the, of the people, the remaining 90, 95% had not self-reported the, the income from that account. And that, that fact also shows up in, in, in different settings. And also like at a more macro level, the fact that, you know, that, that these amnesties that, you know, that countries do to, to bring home uh, offshore assets, once they are, they are combined with a credi credible detection risk, you have like really, really large uh, declarations of offshore accounts. And like these declarations are you know, in their nature kind of assets that, that were not tax compliant to start with. 
And here I want to just emphasize this caveat that basically a lot of things are going on now in terms of policy, and I'll talk more about that in a second. And so it could be that this third fact here is, is changing. Uh, so we'll, we'll, that's an important uh, question. All right. So um, let me now move on to the, the first uh, question that I decided to, to ask uh, myself here, like preparing the, the lecture. And the question is, so is there a development, development gradient in the exposure to these offshore tech havens? So here I've really tried to, to think of what are, the, what are this, the data sources that allow us to say something about uh, this exposure uh, by country, basically, like not at the global level, but by country. Uh, that involves both kind of like really kind of hard macro data. It also involves some of these leaks that are often helpful to, to say something uh, about like cross-country patterns. Um, and, and also like so estimates that can, that can come out of research papers and try to combine these different uh, sources. Before I move to the data, let's just ask ourselves, so why should we care about this? Uh, why do we care about whether like this challenge is, is more or less serious uh, in developing countries. So I think one way to motivate that question is that, you know, exactly like what we mentioned before, that a lot of the policy development now happens at the, at the global uh, level. So it could be the OECD, it could be the Global Forum, which is like part of the OECD, or, or other uh, international forum. And of course, when you start thinking about, you know, how should we address this challenge, then, you know, different policy designs are possible. You can, you can address it in different ways. And, I, and the, the, the policy preference here might really like, depend on what kind of country you are, how many administrative resources uh, you have, and ultimately also like, your, the level of, of development. And, uh, and you know, like, if we are trying to, to balance these like, different policy preferences across different countries, well, then it kind of matters like, where the problem is, right? Like, if, if, it's, if this offshore challenge is really only or or almost only affecting developed countries, but then maybe it's fine that we have like policy designs that really, you know, um, fit the needs of developed countries. But you know, like if, if it's the other, other way around, if like if, if it, the, the challenge is actually bigger in developing countries, then maybe we should take more seriously kind of the, the concerns and the needs of developing countries when we design these, these global uh, approaches to, to the offshore challenge. Um, I also started, before I looked at the data, I thought about what, what do I expect here, like what are my priors, and I think it's actually not obvious what to expect. I think there are arguments like suggesting that you would find more offshore exposure in developing countries. Uh, first of all, you know that these assets are really concentrated at the top, while you often have more inequality in developing countries, so that would speak to having like more offshore exposure. You also probably on average have like less enforcement on foreign income like so so and that you know it, maybe it's easier to do offshore evasion so then you would expect uh, more of it and then there are a couple of things that you know make you know say well maybe people are not always like they, they put money offshore not like the first reason is not uh, offshore evasion it could be that you're just worried about the, a weak or like uh, yeah a weak domestic financial sector, maybe you are corrupt and you get your, your gains in a, in, a, in a corrupt way, and then you kind of you use uh, foreign banks, and then like once you have your money there, then you also kind of engage in, in innovation. But there are also, uh, I think, arguments that go the other way. I mean, you could, I mean, prob as, just as there is probably on average kind of less enforcement of like, taxation on foreign income, there's probably also kind of more domestic evasion opportunities. So if you can evade easily domestically, why would you bother to, to do it offshore? Uh, sometimes tax rates are, are low, like in developing countries, on, on some of these types of income. And then there's also like a, a ge ge geographical uh, argument here that we, we know like from other studies that uh, it kind of matters how close tax havens are to you. Many tax havens are either in Europe or like in the Caribbean or in, in East Asia. Um, and, you know, like, so I, I would say that the, the average developing country probably like has a longer distance, geographical distance to the, to the closest uh, tax haven. So that would speak in favor of, you know, like having less exposure in developing countries. But let's have a look at the data now that we have established that it's not kind of a priori obvious uh, which way this gradient goes. And I'll start by looking at data from the Bank for International Settlements, uh, which is an international institution that collects information um, of, about different things. Uh, for example, cross-border deposits in 49 financial centers. So in the, in the 50 biggest uh, financial centers in the world, you can actually see kind of directly uh, 
the deposits that are owned by foreigners and you know, what the, the counterpart countries are. So you have information here about like, how many deposits do South Africans have in Switzerland, how many deposits do uh, uh, Indonesians have in Luxembourg, and, and so on. All right? So that's, you know, like at face value, this is a great data source. It also has some limitations. So first of all, there's only one class of assets here. It doesn't cover kind of all financial assets, but only deposits. It's also not all tax havens that allow these data to be published. I think you know, that, that's really something we should, as researchers, kind of push that, that it will be more uh, publicly available. But, but now I can only look at, at a subset of tax havens here. And also this data, it doesn't look through kind of holding structures. So if I decide to be a little bit smarter than the others and hold my Swiss account not in my own name, but through like, my own you know, like, corporation in Panama, then like, uh, this data set will say, well, this is kind of Panama-owned deposits, although, in fact, it's, it's my deposits. All right, so this is another limitation. So when I just take, uh, like, make this, so I just make a simple bin scatter plot here, just by reading grouping countries by uh, their GDP per capita, their income level, and then I say, how important are these offshore deposits as a fraction of GDP? You can see that there's almost no gradient here, like, it, it's a very weak gradient, and if anything, uh, there seem to be slightly more of these offshore deposits in, like, belonging to developing countries than developed uh, countries. But, but not a very, uh, not a very um, steep gradient. So the next uh, data source I found is like, from a paper by, again, like myself and Gabriel Sukman and Annette Alstenseder, where we kind of try to, to like, really improve those statistics by kind of allocating all financial assets, so not just deposits, but also stocks and bonds and so on, uh, in all tax havens, so not just the ones that publish the, publish the statistics uh, with the BIS, and also going to try to allocate stuff that, are, that, are looked, uh, that, that belong to, to these holding structures. So this is kind of like trying to solve the problem like more generally, but also imposing some like uh, strong assumptions. And, and basically, you cannot do this really after 2007. So it's like it's also pretty, pretty old uh, data. And once you do that, you get this picture. Like so, this is the same picture, but just for another kind of measure of offshore financial wealth. And here, there's just there's no gradient at all. It really looks like this offshore challenge is really. I mean, of course, there are, there's variation across countries, but it doesn't correlate at all with the income level of, uh, of the country. All right, so it's essentially the same challenge that we are facing, whether we are developing or developed countries. So uh, until now, I talked only about financial assets. So uh, another asset class that is receiving more and more attention is like so offshore real estate. Uh, so for example, I have a paper uh, where we look at, you know, who are the owners of, uh, of like, the real estate in, the, in London, for example, or in the UK, there's a lot of that that is owned by offshore corporations. And we're also trying to find out, so who are the, the beneficial owners hiding behind these, these corporate uh, shields? Um, so now I'm going to show you some uh, numbers from another paper that, that focuses more on, on, on another property market, so in Dubai. Uh, and they have uh, access to leaked data where you can actually see like, who are the owners of these Dubai properties. And again, what I'm trying to do now is to uh, to, to say something about how like, ownership of Dubai properties, how that correlates with income. Limitations here, this is only one property market, and actually I think that this paper kind of you know, confounds a little bit offshore evasion and, and just housing. There are just many people who, who just, I mean, expats in Dubai who just live there and buy a house, and that will also be counted here. If you, despite these limitations, make the same exercise, you get this picture. Uh, and here, suddenly, you start seeing like, uh, a development gradient, so that it, it's, the picture suggests that you know, like, low-income uh, countries tend to have like, more to buy uh, property relative to, their, to the size of their economy than, uh, than high-income countries. And actually, we, in our paper for London, we see a similar pattern that, kind of, that African countries, for example, and uh, Southeast, Asian, uh, Southeast Asian countries, they, they really stand out as like they are, seem to be kind of major owners of, of this real estate in London that is, that is held through corporations in Jersey or, or other places. And then finally, uh, I'm going to show you data here on like, incorporation in, in offshore tax havens. So, this is, uh, so we know that there are many people who, like, so many wealthy people who hold offshore assets, they will often not do it in their own name, but they will do it through like, a corporate shell in another haven, for example. And so this inter uh, international consortium of, of investigative journalists, so they have been 
actually, like over a number of years, they have collected kind of uh, neat data from many different sources. The most uh, famous one is probably the Panama Papers from Mossack Fonseca, like one law firm in Panama, where you actually have data on, you know, like the, the, like the, in, the incorporation uh, of these offshore shells and who kind of the, the real owner like, of, of these shells uh, was. So you don't know anything about kind of the, the assets that are underneath. You don't know um, at all like whether it was set up for like, a legitimate purpose or whether it was like really for set up for tax evasion purposes. Uh, but we know like that part of it at least is, uh, is, is tax evasion. And of course, like here again, when you have a lead sample, this is only like data from one corporate provider, so it could be like that, that, that there is some selection into that, and so on and so on. Uh, but let's just try to make the same exercise, nevertheless, to see like what, so are there more or less incorporations done by people in low-income countries relative to high-income countries? And here it seems if you kind of relate the number of incorporations in these offshore jurisdictions to GDP, you find kind of the opposite slope, suggesting that like these more sophisticated uh, evasion structures maybe are more kind of prevalent in, in developed countries. All right. So if you bring all this together, you get this picture that is somehow somewhat mixed. Uh, you see that you know if you just focus on financial assets, you get like basically no gradient. We are facing the same challenge, uh, irrespective of our, our income uh, level. There might be a, a bias where you know like developed con developing countries have a different composition of their or offshore portfolio with more real estate in it, less financial assets, and there might be some signs here that like maybe. Evaders in uh, developed countries are slightly more sophisticated in terms of like using offshore uh, companies in their in their structures. But at least, I mean, there's nothing here telling us that you know we should only uh, be concerned with the needs of developed countries because this is only a rich country phenomenon. It is not. It's really kind of this also uh, is a, a, a serious uh, challenge in uh, developed uh, developing countries. All right. So how am I doing on time? Do you have a Sorry? 10 minutes. All right, great. So, um, so let me say something about policy now. So, this is, so there's really, this is a, a very active policy field with a lot of, of work done over the last decade or two decades. And the question here is really like whether these new kind of emerging policy designs, whether they, we, we should think that they are actually working well, are they a good fit uh, for developing countries? And so, so the background here is that you know, like that, most of this effort has been been spearheaded by the OECD. And what had, I mean, so and you know, different policy designs have been proposed. Uh, but what has you know prevailed as the dominating paradigm here is really a cross-border exchange of information. All right. And the idea is, is is pretty simple and intuitive. The idea is that you know, like that the problem here for tax authorities is a lack of information. It's really like we have people who have their assets offshore and we don't know how much income they have, so we can't tax it. So if we can bring the tax havens to tell us something about that income, we can just go ahead and tax it as if it were domestic income. All right, so just information exchange across borders is just a way to overcome this fundamental information uh, imperfection. And so, so most of this, the, the policy efforts here have really been focused on making offshore tax havens deliver information on these assets and on the income that they generate. All right? So that's, that's the, like the, the principle that, that you know, really lies under many of the efforts in the last decade. And, uh, and things have been moving fast, and I would say, like, so, so what, is, what has now emerged in the last five years as kind of the, the specific uh, dominating uh, policy design is what you could say is comprehensive and automatic information exchange. Meaning that banks basically all over the world, they need nowadays to always identify the beneficial owners of the accounts. All right? So uh, they need to know who the beneficial owner is, if there is one. It could be like a listed company, a Microsoft, there's no beneficial owner, but if there is one, they have to know who it is. And then uh, once they, they have done that, they need to collect account information and then they have to share that account information with the home country of the account owner, all right? In an automatic and comprehensive manner. Meaning that if I, tomorrow, open an account in Switzerland, well then, next year, the Danish tax authorities will get a report from my Swiss bank saying what was my end of year account balance, 
what income did I earn in this account in terms of interest, dividends, uh, other things, that in principle, you know, like really allow them to, to, to tax this income as if it were domestic income. And uh, so this is a surprise to many that actually we've come so far. This is like a super ambitious uh, policy that really has like, it's incredible that we've come to this point where basically we have uh, been able to like set up a system with, with this like third party report information in a, in a cross border uh, manner. And then you might think, ah, but you know, like, uh, so is it really, does it really cover kind of all the important places? Aren't there still places where I can just, you know, get around this? Well, basically, like, I would say, like, all the major financial centers in the world are doing this. There's no kind of obvious place where they have, like, a, a good kind of wealth management industry where you can just go and, uh, and circumvent this. And so, so more than 100 countries uh, engage in this kind of uh, information exchange. And so Angela was telling a lot uh, more about this in, the, in her uh, talk yesterday. Um, so in theory, this is great, right? This is really like if you ask like a public finance theorist what we need, he will say this is what we need. We just need to bring this information like back to the home country, and then you know they can they can really they can do like optimal taxation because they they can really treat kind of domestic and foreign financial income in exactly the same way, which is what what you want basically. In practice, this is not easy. Right? It's not easy to make work, and I think we're still also in the, in the infancy of, of this, and we're still learning, and we're getting better all the time, probably. But, but I think we need to be aware that there are like, some considerable uh, difficulties. So just like, imagine the tax authority, they receive kind of a, a, a batch of, of account-level data from like 100 different countries, and now they have to start finding out, okay, like, so this report that I received, like on a Mr. Jones, who is the Mr. Jones kind of in, in my country that, that is kind of, uh, that has this foreign account? So you have to match all this foreign information to domestic taxpayers. Sometimes there's a tax ID number in the reports, but not always. Uh, so there's a lot of kind of stuff that just can't be matched. Once you have matched to individuals, you have to start, you know, matching like this foreign information to domestic income categories. That's also not obvious in practice. And then one thing that, that I have learned like over the, the last year, I think, just that so even, even once you have like done step one and two perfectly, so okay, I know Mr. Jones had a thousand uh, or a million dollars of dividend income in, in Switzerland. So then I need to tax that. But actually, in order to tax it, I need to know something about the exact portfolio that he has, because he'll have like the right to get credit for foreign taxes that he paid. So you need to know exactly like whether he held U.S. shares or German shares or Dutch shares to be able to actually assess like what taxes he already has paid abroad and credit that on a domestic tax basis. So just like handling foreign source taxes is a mess and kind of the information that you get from foreign banks is not enough to, to do this in an automated way. So, um, so there's a lot of practical difficulties that probably can be overcome, but, but, but they are there, okay? And I think that the right way to, to see this it's really that, you know, like this new information exchange is like, like you have to see it as an enforcement tool. And, you know, and, and, and this is something, a tool that tax authorities can, can decide to, to use or not use. And if you decide to use it, it requires a lot of administrative resources, a lot of capacity inside tax authorities to actually use this information right. And, uh, and I think you, you know, I've, I've been working like, with this kind of data like, in three countries, uh, Denmark, the US, and South Africa, and I think like, in all three countries, there's, there's clearly scope for improvement, and this is, this is difficult everywhere like, to, to, do this, uh, to do this right. Um, so if we think of this kind of... Um, so is there something we could do, is there something easy we could do here to, to kind of... Uh, address this, this, this challenge. And here I want to kind of move back in time, actually uh, almost 20 years, to kind of the first policies that the European Union uh, introduced to address this challenge of observation. So they made, basically, they were making deals with, uh, with a number of offshore tax havens, and they were basically, here the key instrument was not information exchange, but was anonymous withholding tax. So the EU was asking Switzerland and Liechtenstein and other places to identify accounts that were owned by EU residents, impose a withholding tax on the interest income accruing to these, uh, to these uh, accounts, and then send the revenue, or most of the revenue, back to the home countries without saying 
who the account owner, owners were. So kind of anonymous withholding as an alternative to uh, information exchange. And so this has gone like really out of fashion. And I mean, so that specific policy had a, a number of flaws that made it completely uh, useless, basically. But if you think about uh, like where we are now, I think it's not crazy to see like an alternative to, to the current information exchange would be, well, now banks are doing all the hard work, kind of looking through all these, uh, all through like these holding structures, identifying beneficial owners and so on. So there is an alternative where they use this information to levy withholding taxes on the income and sending it to, uh, to the, the home countries of the, of the account owners without disclosing um, who the owners are. And, you know, and of course there's a, a trade-off. You can argue, you know, that, I mean, transparency is always good. It's good for tax authorities to know, like, who the people are. Uh, if, if with this solution you cannot have progressive taxation because you'll just, like, get a flat withholding tax on all income, and so on and so on. So there are clearly cons, but I think there's also one pro, which is, like, really that you, especially if you have low administrative capacity, that then you'll just get a check from tax havens once a year, instead of getting like a batch of information that you have to work really hard to kind of to, to match with, the, with domestic tax records and, and try to impose uh, taxes. And like in principle, you could imagine that these two policy designs could co coexist, right? Uh, it's totally possible, so we are asking the banks to do the hard work. You can imagine you, can imagine you say it's up to the country, to the, the, the home country of the account owner itself to say whether we want information or whether we just want to check. And, you know, and countries might have different preferences over these two policies. And, uh, and you know, I, I can imagine that it might call it the development that maybe, maybe on average kind of tax authorities in developing, developed countries are like more used to handling, you know, like, um, yeah, big data and combining them and, you know, like uh, third party reports and so on. Uh, it's probably not true always, but, but uh, so, so this could kind of uh, call it with, with development. All right. And this is, this is really what I'm trying to, to say here, that you know, like what, we are, what we are doing now is that we are really, that we, are, we design policies at the global level, and we really make one design that we require to, like, everybody to, to use. Uh, I think this policy design maybe like, is, is less well-suited for countries with less administrative resources, and probably on average uh, they will be developing countries. It, it might be desirable to really adopt a more flexible policy menu where we could kind of, like, kind of lever leveraging the same information that banks are taking out now for us, we could leverage in, in two different ways. All right. Um, just a very brief discussion because now I was, uh, so now I really said what I wanted to say about this, like, this field of. Uh, of like offshore tax evasion, and I think the key insight is really this: that you know the policies that we that we develop, they rely heavily on information exchange, and and that is just like difficult in practice, and probably more difficult on average for for developing countries. Uh, I want to talk, return briefly to kind of to other things that that uh, tax havens do. Do I have a few minutes uh, left? I, two minutes. Perfect. Perfect. So, um, so, so I decided to, to focus on offshore Asian, but let's return to, to corporate taxation and see is there kind of is there a, some of the same issues arising there? And I think that the question is is yes. So, so one key policy innovation in the field of global of of, uh, of corporate taxation is the global minimum tax of 15 percent. So there's a lot of details here, but the key principle is this: you know, assume that you have like a multinational firm like Google, and some of their profits are booked in Bermuda. And let's just assume, for the sake of the example, that Bermuda taxes these profits at uh, 1%. Well, then, with this new global minimum tax, the, the, the US can say, well, you know, there's a 15% is the minimum tax rate in the world. So if Bermuda foregoes that, you know, that right to tax up to 15%, we will impose a top of tax of 14% to bring the total global taxation up to 15%. And the question is, like, do we have some of the same problems here? Uh, I think yes, because like the way this is done in practice, so how, how does the US know what the taxation in Bermuda is of Google? Well, because under this policy, Google now has to you know, give them information about uh, where they earn revenue, where they pay taxes, and so on, on a country-by-country -country, uh, basis. And the US will then share that information uh, with other countries. So, kind of, so this information sharing is also here kind of like the, a key me mechanism that is uh, like basically 
a requirement for this to work properly. And, and you can imagine if you are a country that is not so good at handling these reports from, from foreign tax authorities and, uh, and match it to your domestic sources and so on, then maybe this top taxation just uh, is also difficult. And, uh, and maybe countries with this problem will not benefit a whole lot from, these, uh, from this kind of information sharing. But I think there's another, uh, there's another you know, side of, the, of this policy, which is that you know, actually the global minimum tax also changes the incentives a lot for tax havens. Because now, in principle, like if you're a tax haven, there's no incentive to have a low tax rate below 50% anymore. Because if you have low tax rates, then the home country will just kind of impose the, the tax that you uh, forego yourself. So there's an incentive here for tax havens to actually raise their tax rate up to the 15%. And that means basically uh, that you'll probably see less profit shifting uh, globally. And you know, through that channel, you can have a, a beneficial impact also on countries that are less good at, at handling uh, information, international information exchange. All right, so that was the, the final point I wanted to say, you know, like that there, is, uh, there are probably some analogs also in, in these other, other fields uh, where the offshore challenge is relevant. Um, so let me just very briefly uh, sum up. So uh, from the, the data kind of tells us that, you know, like offshore, the offshore challenge is not just relevant for developed countries. It also it appears that developing countries are as or even more exposed to, to it uh, than, than developed countries are. Uh, second point, like these new global policy standards to counter the offshore challenge, they often rely heavily on information exchange and uh, there's a, a real risk, I think, that countries with low administrative capacity are not fully able to reap the benefits of these policies. That's one thing. And the other thing is, like, alternatives do exist. There are ways to kind of to leverage, like, all this uh, new information collection done by banks in a way that is kind of easy, more easily minimal uh, than the current regime. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Niels, for this. Um, definitely lots to think about and lots to discuss now. So um, we now have plenty of time for questions and answers. When you have a question, please raise your hand, and then we have colleagues who will go around with the mics. Thank you. Dominika Langenmeier, Catholic University, Eichstätt, Ingolstadt in Germany. Great talk, Niels. Thank you very much. I wanted to ask about your alternative policy um, I always thought that one main channel that automatic exchange of information is working is not only that tax authorities get the information, but also that tax evaders fear that they might be using this information and with a higher detection probability are more likely to declare their income. Now, if we have banks collect the tax and remit it, we really have to trust that the banks are doing, right? Because the second channel is going away. So. I was wondering if you have any thoughts on, on the quality of the work banks and tax havens are actually doing. So how good is the information and how much would you trust them to collect the withholding tax? We'll take um, two more questions now, the gentleman there and then the gentleman in the very front. Yes, yeah, so this is the German corner here. I'm Christian von Haldenwein from the German Institute of Development and Sustainability. I just wanted to ask you, are you planning to develop um, perhaps a more diversified set of country categories because you are now talking about developed and developing countries which are groups that um, hide substantial heterogeneity and the question would be are you thinking about you know being more specific with regard to uh, smaller and, and, and more accurate perhaps groups of countries? Thank you. No, th thank you very much. I'm Chili Zimarala from South Africa, but I'm also director of uh, United Nations University. Uh, I, I, maybe this is just uh, not directly related to your presentation. Last week I was reading on Financial Times, and they were saying that there is a, a fight uh, for control of tax policies by the United Nations and uh, the OECD. Uh, is this something that we should be worried about? Uh, and what are some of the implications of these multiple policies uh, uh, that, uh, that potentially are there? Uh, uh, do they 
do they create opportunities for tax evaders to uh, to do their jobs, you know, or bad jobs, you know, of, of evading tax? Thank you. Over to you. Okay. Um, so let me just start with Dominica's question. So, uh, so if I hear you correctly, you are saying that if I'm an offshore evader, like, so there's always a risk that banks don't do the job that they're supposed to do. But if I'm an offshore evader, like, I might be, you know, I don't know whether my bank will or not do the, the, the job well. And just because I don't know, then I'll be, I'll be compliant. Whereas uh, in the regime that I was kind of suggesting, you could say, well, I'm just, you know, I'm just taking my chances. And, uh, and if they do their job, I'll pay a tax. But if, if not, then, you know, I'm, I'm off the hook. I think that's right. I think that's uh, that kind of the deterrence effect like disappears with this alternative regime. Um, so that, that's probably another, another con then. So then you, you really you rely even more on kind of each bank in the world to really do exactly what they are what they're supposed to do. Um, but you know, I, I think even like with the existing regime, I don't think anyone has really showed that, but you like you, you still would rely a lot on banks to do exactly what they're supposed to do. And even if there is one or two banks that don't like choose not to do it, well then I think there's a real fear that you can get like this selection of, of like Die hard tax evaders into those banks that kind of the rumors will spread that these guys, this bank over here, that they don't report what they should do, and, and that's why I moved my account uh, over there. Um, so I think in, in any case, we rely a lot on banks nowadays to, to, to kind of dig out information for us. I'm not sure that we do enough to really like to make sure that they do. I, I don't know of any you know audits of banks or like any systematic control um, of banks. So in, I have some work in Denmark where we actually we, we try to speak a bit to this question uh, about like uh, whether banks actually kind of send out the reports they're supposed to do. So using using money transfer data, we can basically kind of identify a, a sample of people who seem to hold foreign accounts, and we then check you know like how many of them uh, actually get a CS report then. And it, it's not everybody. Like so, there's clearly kind of uh, also holes in the in the current CRS uh, coverage. But, uh, but I think that, that challenge is really like, is, is there like, no matter what regime you, you go for. Um, so then there's a question about like, whether I, sh I should use a different typology of, of countries, I guess, or a different grouping of countries. So now I'm just basically, I don't even, in the data work, I don't even like, make any thresholds distinguishing uh, developing and developed countries. That's probably also meaningful, uh, meaningless. So, so what I'm doing is just basically correlating all these, uh, these outcomes with, uh, with, with uh, income, like per capita income levels. And of course, you could have like a, a, different, a different measure of development. Uh, I, I think like at the, at the broader level, I think you are completely right that there's a lot of heterogeneity, like both among developing and developed countries. Um, so the dimension I'm particularly interested in here maybe is, is really, you know, how good is the tax administration? How many resources do they have? How good are they at, you know, at incorporating, you know, foreign data sets into their, their uh, tax control? I guess that there'll be a development gradient in that, uh, that measure, but I'm actually not sure. Like, so in, in, there are some fields where developing countries have, have better data and do more to collect data than developed countries. Um, so VAT, for example, like uh, I think is an ex example of you know where you actually have like much more granular and detailed data in, in some developing countries. Uh, so this is this is by no means kind of a one-to-one a -one, uh, correlation with the, with per capita income. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just not sure like how exactly to, to do this. Uh, if you have any ideas of like specific ways of, of slicing the sample, I'll, I'd be happy to to hear that. And then the last uh, question about uh, so like who actually who should we like to whom should we delegate this job of like designing global policies in this uh, in this field? And you know I, I think like honestly I think that the OECD has been doing a good job. Like so they have really managed to to bring us to a place now that that no one had hoped I think ten years ago that that we would be. Um, but it's probably also right that they are, I mean, it, it is like as a starting point, like a place where developed countries meet and discuss solutions to their policy problems. And, uh, and probably there's not been enough 
uh, of an year lent to kind of the needs of, uh, of, of developing countries. And I think there's absolutely an, an argument for like, saying like, where is like the, the most legitimate kind of global forum that, that probably is uh, the UN. So, so like th that would make it a natural place to, to place these uh, policy developments. Uh, and then, of course, there's also some path dependency here. You also, maybe you're worried that there's a lot of, you know, just like skill and expertise and experience at the OECD that you might lose if you just uh, move everything to the, to the UN. Um, so I, I don't have like a definitive answer, but I, I totally see like where, where, where you're going. Thank you. Um, next round of questions. Okay. Uh, yeah, start with the lady on your left, Alumi, and then take the lady on your right, and then at the back, the gentleman, that's the next three questions. Thank you, thank you very much for that very stimulating uh, presentation on tax havens. Uh, my name is Karen Kandia from the National Treasury of uh, Kenya. Uh, my question is, um, oh, when we come to Africa in particular, uh, the amount of resources that uh, come from Africa and uh, banked probably in tax havens like in Switzerland, and not only, of course, by our own politicians, but also a lot by the mining companies that extract a lot of natural resources uh, from Africa. And uh, as we know today, um, post the COVID uh, pandemic and the, um, uh, the, the depreciation of our of, uh, African currencies, our debt levels have grown for, uh, by more than 30% uh, to 50% just because of the dollar being stronger. And probably some of the money from those tax havens uh, would be sufficient to pay this debt. And also, for instance, would be uh, um, sufficient to improve the livelihoods of uh, people in Africa. I did see the, um, well, there's a lot of concern about development. I mean, that's why we are here. We're talking about development in Africa and so on. There's a lot of multilateral loans. There's a lot of grants. Um, how can you support us to get this money back to the continent? And uh, I did see one of the policy initiatives you mentioned was the EU. Um, trying to get withholding tax on the interest earned from the money that is uh, held in these tax havens. I mean, that would be a good start. And for instance, it would be sufficient to pay for uh, social support. Uh, I don't know what kind of initiative uh, or how we can incentivize you to support us in this because this money is in the West. Thank you. Thank you, Niels, for this very uh, interesting presentation, really thought-provoking. Uh, Angela Sadell, Global Forum on Transparency and Exchange of Information. I, I was thinking about your proposal, and I wanted to ask you a question which may be a bit provocative or maybe just uh, um, lead you to a more nuanced conclusion here, because what we are talking here at this conference is about revenue for development. Um, I can see where you're coming from in saying in short term that will generate revenues, but how would you evaluate your proposal in the context of what is a bigger thing here? It's development, because a longer way by bridging the differences in capacities between developed and developing countries in terms of tax administration and saying what we are trying to achieve is to work with developing countries to make sure that their tax administration is up to speed and being able to utilize that information would that come on the corporate tax umbrella or on the personal income tax umbrella? Is long-term a better solution for development uh, rather than a short-term uh, objective of uh, revenue? Thank you. Hello, I'm Olav Lundstöll from Norwegian Embassy in Tanzania. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Uh, just, just a few follow-up on, uh, I was just wondering on your axis, I, I, I assume that when you're comparing wealth, you, you were looking at the absolute, or, or was it the, rel or the relative rather? Because there's been quite a lot of research showing that on, uh, if you look at the relative numbers, uh, then the development gradient uh, is present. 
But I'm just wondering what, whether you are concluding something different. That was the first one. And the second one is that I assume also that the wealth uh, composition could be different between countries, both offshore and, and domestic, uh, and also be between different type of countries. And this would, uh, would affect a bit the results that you're having. And I would also have a question a bit on whether you are covering through your data all different financial instruments, because as we know, there has been a huge growth in options, for example, the certain financial instruments that might also, I don't have ex exact knowledge on this, but that is outnumbering in totals by far traditional bank, bank or financial deposits. So I'm just wondering whether you see that also in the Bank of International Settlements data and whether you're capturing this when you're looking at uh, offshore issues. And then finally, it would be interesting, like the German colleague was saying here also, to have a decomposition by regions, so sub-Saharan Africa perhaps, mm. by resource-rich countries, mm. uh, aid-dependent countries, and FDI, and different categories to really get a more nuanced uh, mm. picture of what is happening. Thanks. We will let you answer now. Yeah, there was uh, multiple questions, each with multiple sub-questions. So, like, let's see if I can <laughs> remember all of it. But so that the first question, I guess, was about mining or like taxation of natural resources. Uh, and I think you're you're totally right that I mean, even so, public finance theory would tell you that kind of that the, the pure rent from mining or other like natural resources should be taxed basically at 100%. Like, so there's no, there's no reason why like a, a developing country with, with these resources would kind of give up some of the pure rent to, to most national uh, firms who are doing the, the mining. Um, so of course you, yeah. And the question is how, we, how do we get there? And this is exactly like what, what all these policies are about, like how do you kind of enable countries to, to make sure that, you know, like both the, the profits that is generated in the country is like taxed at the rate that the country chooses, and also that the wealth of the people living in the country are, is being taxed like uh, in this country at the rate that the country chooses. So I think like all these policies are about kind of getting where you want to go to a place where like uh, where rents and, and wealth can be taxed where, where it should be taxed. And I think just history tells us that, that I mean, there's no easy fix here. Like, so it's, it's exactly like about you know, yeah, improving designs uh, and and um, and also adjusting them maybe to the specific needs of specific countries uh, to to get as close to to where you wanna go as as possible. So, um, yeah, the world is an imperfect place. I'm sorry. Um, so. To Angela's question, uh, so the way I understand it, and there's something we discussed uh, yesterday also, like uh, at lunch, which is like you know, maybe information, information change uh, is important, like in automatic information change is important in the way it's being done right now, not just because it you know like it brings in some some revenues to the countries who receive this information and, and use it in the right way, but also because it becomes you know like. Uh, a way to, to practice and, you know, like uh, also there was indeed there's a lot of effort to actually build capacity centers as like in countries that are not uh, so, so many resources uh, that can actually spill over into like domestic taxation that you can be like, maybe once you have learned to handle all this foreign information, then you it becomes you become better at, you know, like getting information from domestic banks about kind of domestic uh, assets or and so it can have like much like it can kind of trickle uh, through the tax administrations and, and, and like actually help them address much more important problems than just offshore evasion. And I think, you know, there is a, a theoretical argument, you know, like for that, I, I would love to, I think this is like a potentially super important story that I would like to, to know more about, but I just don't know in practice whether it's, uh, it's true or not. I'd also like to, to talk to some of you about uh, this hypothesis if you have some opinions. Um, and then the, the last question was more about like some of the uh, like the, the methodologies or so I, 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 I'm the first to you know concede that these data sources are imperfect and you know like the BIS data is only deposits so it doesn't have securities it doesn't have like stocks and bonds it doesn't have real estate so it is really like a very a very narrow you could say uh, asset class. Um, I think maybe where I, I don't agree with you is that there is kind of that there is that it's obvious that the gradient would be go the other way or be very strong if you had better data. I think like so. Just I've really tried to dig out what I could, 
and uh, and like the second measure like should like tries to account for like other financial assets uh, to the extent possible. Probably not stock options, but I'm I'm not sure like how important that is. Uh, so if you have ideas for kind of better data or ways to measure this in a, in a different and better way, I'm I'm all ears. But I, I think I think it's not obvious that there is a very strong development gradient once you, uh, you you do things with improved uh, methods and data. We have time. Oh, and if I can just like the last question about like uh, I, I really I, I like these suggestions for kind of uh, different groupings of of countries. For example, but I mean so resource uh, reliance is. I think will be very important. It's, uh, I, I have worked myself, like showing that, you know, when countries have like oil price shocks, so they suddenly have a bigger resource rent, then some of that money shows up on offshore accounts. Uh, so I, I think you will be, I think you will, you would find that, that resource-rich countries just on average have more uh, assets offshore. Thank you. Um, so we can only take short questions now. <laughs> so. I will take two more short questions because we're actually running a bit out of time otherwise. So, uh, oh no, <laughs> you're not making this easy for me. So, um, so I, I'll uh, take the question here from the lady in the front, Ellen. Um, and then for gender balance, uh, one, one question <laughs> from male colleague. I think you have had your hand up a while. So we'll do that and everyone else, please um, feel free uh, to find a seat next to Niels for lunch. I'm, I'm giving away your lunch date. I'm That's sorry. fine. I'm um, happy to. Yeah. Thank you so much for uh, the great presentation. My name is Aline from Uganda. In my view, um, automatic exchange of information is really the way to go. Yes, we'll struggle to use the data in the beginning to map it onto our tax system to kind of identify any gaps. But um, I feel um, gradually to become easier and we can actually um, help out each other as a block, uh, developing countries or maybe Africa and see how to utilize this data, grow um, that analytics to kind of find the gaps. I feel that it, that would be a better alternative going in the long run. Thank you so much. Th there was a comment, not a question. Is that right? Yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Peter from um, NORAD. Um, as you mentioned, there are some um, policy changes that have recently taken place that um, uh, creates questions about where are we now in the issue of offshore tax evasion. And um, when you have these numbers about offshore wealth, then there's some assumptions behind uh, what sort of obstacles stand between tax authorities and the correct taxation of offshore wealth. Mm -hmm. The key focus has been the obstacle of information, mm -hmm. but actually tax havens offer a variety of obstacles. For instance, they can create legal ambiguity about who have the right to tax this wealth, mm -hmm. or is it possible to tax it at all? Um, and I think now we're at the moment where so much information is being exchanged that you can say that almost all the offshore wealth is perhaps captured in some way in the information exchange system, but we still know very little about whether this is accessible mm. in a legal way to tax authorities. And this creates a risk that we're really speaking uh, past each other on whether or not we have sort of solved the problem or not. And so I just wanted to to make you reflect a little bit on that and also maybe perhaps ask the Global Forum, you know, like uh, what can be done in terms of getting tax authorities to report back on, okay, you get all this information, how much of it is actually, you know, legally uh, easy for you to use uh, or, or, or is it in trusts or in all kinds of uh, legal uh, systems that actually make it really hard to, to just uh, tax it? So I think, I mean, you're totally right that there are still issues along these lines. I think, I mean, like the current policy design does a lot, right? Like I think that's, you also give it credit to actually do a lot to, to try to look through all these financial structures and holding structures and trust and so on. So like, you know, like there's also, I think it, it, like we are trying, 
Uh, so there's another issue is like about which like who actually has the taxing right, and I think it's it's a true it's a real problem that you know the the very wealthiest people like the ones that we really want to tax well, well they also have lifestyles where they probably have multiple residences and and so on. So it and Dominica has shown in her research that I mean some of these people they they use this ambiguity like in a strategic way by basically obtaining golden passports in places where they don't enforce taxes so much and like so so they are like they're Clearly, it challenges along these lines too. Um, but but that said, I mean, so like information exchange, really, I mean, it, it must be a step forward, and it's it's imperfect, and we we are still learning to to um, to, to use information better. But uh, and maybe there are solutions to the problems you you point to like uh, a bit down the road. But we have to have to start somewhere, and I think in a way uh, we have we have I think come a pretty long way already. Thank you, everybody, uh, also for all these questions and comments at this point. It's time for me to pass over to Kunal. But before I do so, I also a big thank you to you for the keynote, but also for picking up all the questions and the sub-questions. And please forgive me that I gave away your lunch date. <laughs>